Hi everybody, my name is Jason Mosley and I'm the CEO of IBIS and welcome to another Partners in the Spotlight. I'm delighted today that we have uh, one of our long-standing global partners with us, Axalta. Uh, and today I'm going to be speaking to their Vice President of Refinish for EMEA, Jim Muse. Welcome, Jim. Hey, thanks, Jason. It's uh, it's great to see you. It's a shame we weren't able to do this face to face, but in these times, we we make do with what we can do. Absolutely, absolutely, Jim. So, look, um, my first first question to you is: Vice President of Refinish for Axalta, EMEA. Uh, that sounds like a huge role, uh, huge responsibilities, many many important markets within your uh, within your responsibility. Tell me a bit more about that role. What's involved? How did you come to that role? Uh, and what are the things you're focused on today? No, no, thank you for asking, Jason. Um, well, I'll tell you, uh, the journey here has started seven years ago. Uh, I joined Exalta right after the carve out of DuPont when Carlisle bought uh, DuPont and made Exalta what it is today. Um, and I joined as the director of sales for North America and spent five years there. I've been fortunate enough to be in a few different roles in my seven years. Um, I, I left that role to take a year long global role as the vice president of sales for Refinish uh, globally, which is where you and I began to become more connected on a global forum, uh, connecting on some of the things that are happening for us and for the industry on a global level. Um, but what I did most of that year was travel around China, some of our emerging markets, and uh, a lot of time in Europe, here in Basel, Switzerland, where I am today. And what I was trying to get to was trying to figure out what we do well in certain areas and what we don't do well in certain areas and share best practices, because it's not something we had historically done. We ran our businesses very regionally. Um, so when I came back looking at EMEA, um, back to Philadelphia, and I met with uh, Robert Bryant, our CEO, and Troy Weaver, the head of our business for Refinish Globally. Uh, I had some really uh, pointed suggestions on the things that we should be doing. I thought that we should be doing. And much to my surprise, both of them reacted the same way. They said, boy, that sounds great. Uh, why don't you pack up your family, uh, pack up your office, and move to Switzerland and uh, start executing some of those opportunities. And you know, I, I say that in joke, uh, but it is really, been an amazing experience so far for a year I've been here um, and right now we're just trying to take some of those things and and make them into an executable model uh, that helps us be better and helps us address the market as it is and it's going to be in the future. So uh, EMEA is a it's made up of many many different markets and cultures so how do you where do you start Jim in terms of you know being such a leader uh, leading the business in, in that in that area, trying to change things across different cultures, different markets, different levels of maturity, different processes. Where where do you where do you where do you start? So I think I think people were really interested to see how you approach that and some of the some of the things that you learn from that. Yeah, I'll tell you, Jason, that's a wonderful question. Um, you know, that was probably the most difficult thing for me, uh, being from North America, being an American. Um, you know, you, you have a lot of thoughts about what you want to do. We tend to move very quickly. Um, and coming here, I really had to take some time to listen to the people that work here. They've got a ton of experience. The quality of our employees in Europe is, is so impressive to me. Um, and they also, they're very methodical in how they work through challenges and the things that they do. Uh, they're, they're a little bit less... Um, uh, like cowboys, they're more thoughtful. Uh, and it took some time for me, if, if I'm honest, it took time for me to adjust to that. And I was fortunate enough to be surrounded by some really strong people that helped me understand the challenges. Now, with that being said, um, I believe there are a great deal of cultural differences. There's obviously a great deal of language difference. Um, what I've been really trying to focus on is not what's different, um, the, the necessary the cultural differences or the language differences, I want to focus more on our professional language so that our organization speaks the same language no matter where we are in the world. Uh, now, that is hard to do. 
um, when you're dealing in you know 30 different countries with multiple different languages, um, but it's starting to come together, it really is. Um, and that's really what I've tried to focus on. Not as much the differences, because I think there's so many more similarities in the collision repair space between Europe and North America and other parts of the world than we think there are. They are amazingly similar. Uh, there are definitely cultural differences, language differences that we have to be sensitive to, uh, but the business itself, while wow, we could really learn a lot from each other because it isn't that different. Yeah. So, so I think I think Jim, you know, reading what you say there, I think with Axalta, knowing Axalta as I do, and obviously we've known each other for a number of years now, that, that strong culture with that within Axalta, that's something that to be shared and. That, that's where you can all unite behind as a global team, those shared values and vision and company culture. So I guess that's what you're saying, to, to appreciate what you do share together and, and bring it more close together in that shared vision. Would that be correct? That would be, that'd be spot on. I, I guess I would summarize that whole long sentence by saying this. There are so many things that are more similar than different. And yeah. I choose to focus on the things that we that are very similar, that we can really improve on and bring the company, no matter where we are, in what region of the world, continue to advance. So a lot more similarities than differences. Okay. So Jim, we've got to, we've got to touch the subject. I know probably a lot of people have, uh, have, uh, are probably sick to death of this, but I'm really interested to get your, your view on this. COVID-19, coronavirus, you know, EMEA you're responsible for. We hear, you know, body shops down 80% capacity, some body shops completely closed. The stories go on, the stories are endless. So as a, as a refinished brand, what has been the impact to you? What have you done to sort of counteract that? Uh, and what's your philosophy to sort of emerge from this stronger? And what are some of the things that you're doing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's unavoidable to talk about this, right, Jason? It, it really is. Um, it has had a dramatic effect. Uh, so let me start with the positive side, right? This thing really started to go uh, down a strange path with the pandemic uh, in early March for us. And, you know, March and April were very difficult, challenging months for us and for most companies around the world. Um, so we did the things that most companies did, you know, short-term time relief for employees and trying to control cost. You know, it's a big machine, right? It's, if, if the business is off as much as it is, it doesn't mean we still don't own our factories and we still don't own our facilities and our training centers and all the people that go in those facilities. So you do what you can uh, to protect your employees, which uh, we've tried to be very thoughtful, putting them first. And... And then you start to think about how do we come out of this? And how, what do we do during that time? And that's what we spent a lot of time doing, Jason, is, is everybody's busy. So now you've yeah. got this time. What are you going to do with it? And we use that time very well, just like you're doing with me today and, and with the IBIS community. We're connecting. I think I was more connected during COVID than I was when I was working uh, without any pandemic. So we use that time to talk about what if and to talk about how we come out. And when we come out, what's the world look like? Does it come back to 100%? Does it come back to 90%? And what decisions do you take based on those different scenarios? And we spent that time valuably looking at our business. So um, we started to come out nicely um, in May, June, steady improvement and July, we just closed out the month. And, you know, we're really starting to get back to somewhat of a normal run rate. Um, so Europe really has been recovering nicely, but then again, we have to think about the news and some hot spots that are re-emerging. So we're, we're being cautiously optimistic, um, but what we did in the short term was just try to uh, make some adjustments in our cost base to get us through it. Fortunately, uh, we're in a position where we're very cash strong as a company, um, but nobody wants to burn off cash. Um, so we tried to get back to our profit centers as quickly as we can, and we're emerging pretty well. 
Um, but it definitely had an effect. It had an effect on all businesses. It, it really did. And and it's still yet to be known if it'll ever come back to 100 percent. Well, will it level off somewhere around 85, 90, 95 percent? You know, we'll all see. Yeah. Jim, a few weeks ago, we we uh, we ran our Ibis Africa event, which uh, you know Axalta were a, a leading uh, a leading part in that, and uh, the team there you know, very much said about putting the customer at the heart of the journey and providing solutions uh, for customers, and I think that comes across in, within the sort of DNA of Axalta. So, you know, from your perspective, surely now is. Uh, and it's important time of any to, to stay close to your customers, to give them solutions. They're going to be looking for efficiencies. They're going to be looking for assistance. So tell us a bit about how you're, you're continuing to keep uh, the customer at the focus, uh, the focus and the, at the heart of Axelta's sort of approach to the market. Yeah, no, and, and, uh, and you know, uh, I want to pause for a second, Jason, and just make sure that I, I do this. I think Ibis has done a wonderful job of staying connected during this time. Uh, at the South Africa event uh, certainly was an indicator of that. Um, so, uh, you know, kudos to you and your team for being able to continue to keep our uh, collision industry connected. So, so I appreciate that. Um, as a member of that community, uh, it's a true value. Uh, so the customer, that's the, it's, it's really interesting. People ask me all the time, has the customer become more demanding? Um, I would say this. I don't think they've become more demanding. I think they've become better educated. I think they've become stronger business people. I think they've become uh, people that measure performance. And in this industry, that forces the entire value chain to up their game meaning Exalter and anybody else, has to perform better to support the people that are measuring their business using true uh, executable KPIs. So um, what you saw in, in our team in South Africa is a very you know, hard focus on the customer. Uh, you're going to see that across the world for us. Uh, we want to put the customer at the center of everything we do. We try to take that external view inside um, versus taking an internal view and taking it outside. Um, so I, I think the customers, the distributors, the importers are all becoming stronger because they have to. And this pandemic that we just talked about has forced them to even run their business even better and stronger and know where every dime is. Um, and they depend on us as a partner to be as thoughtful about their, you know, their money as they are to make sure that we're being as efficient as we can be uh, providing them service. And, 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 you know, I guess that's a long-winded way to say uh, our customers, due to the fact that they have become every year far better educated and better business people, they're forcing us to become a better company and provide more and more value to them that they have value in, not that we produce something that we think is kind of neat. Um, we produce things as a response to the market realities and a response to what our customers actually need. Great, thanks, Jim. And I, and I think leading on from that, you know, you, it's clear that Axalta, you know, it, 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 there's obviously a core to your business, there's, there's core customers, but what I see from, from Axalta, and, and you can sort of comment on this, is what you do in the wider collision community to to make sure that you assist in the markets in in thought leadership shared practices young people skills all these things that may not directly have an immediate impact on your business but are there very much for the overall strength for the long term of our industry so i see that is is a very important component to maybe axalta's culture and and how they or perceived in the market. Would I be correct in that? Yeah, Jason, you know, you and I have talked about that many times. Uh, the workforce, the future workforce of our industry for the collision centers, for the distributors, for us as a manufacturer and our competitors, um, we need to source people. We need to find talented people to bring into this business. It's a great business. And you and I, you've, heard, you've probably heard me say that more than you want me to, but uh, it's been a very good business for me. I've been in it for 30 years. Um, I love it. 
Uh, and I think there's great opportunity here for a young person. And I want to make sure that we continue to stay focused on that because it is a challenge across the entire industry, not just for the technicians in the collision centers, but also for distribution, for manufacturers, uh, talent base, finding good employees, finding good, um, qualified, motivated, intelligent people to come into this market to take us to the next level uh, is going to be critical. And we do. We, we've got that built into our culture. Uh, we try to promote that across the globe in our industry, not just within Exalta. Um, we always talk about what, our, what we're doing with our own legacy training center footprint. Right? I think it's interesting that we hold on to a legacy footprint. And I think it's a, it's a question that we need to answer sometime is customers want more online, on-site, or virtual training. And we hold on to a legacy footprint of training centers around the world. And I think they're, they're invaluable. And I think we will always have them. But we need to start to invest in getting education and information out there, getting it online, getting it virtual, getting it so that everybody has access to it, and that we can begin to up the talent level and knowledge level of the people that work in our industry. Brilliant. Very, very interesting, Jim. So let's 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 just let's just look at refinish specifically re refinish now. Um, you and I have heard about trends in collisions declining, volumes falling, less crashes, autonomous vehicles. We know the story. We've got maybe let's say we've got five, four or five of the big key refinish players in the market. How do you see that mapping out the next few years in terms of maybe declining volumes or different types of, of repair work? Um, you have four or five paint players at the moment. Do you think that will change? Um, how do you see it over the next few years? And what may be happening? I know we haven't got a crystal ball, but I'd really like to get your view on where you think that might map out in the, in the, in the immediate few years. Yeah, let me see if I can address that question this way, Jason. Um, the beauty of our industry has always been, uh, and I've said this many times, the beauty of our industry is it's almost recession-proof. It's not completely recession-proof, but it's almost recession-proof. But what it is not is technology-proof. It is, it is going to have an effect on our business. You know, I'd say five years ago, I didn't think that much about the advancements in autonomous vehicles, but I do now. Um, but the reality is, uh, with being somewhat recession-proof, it's also been a mature market. The collision repair space has been uh, at about the same level as it has been for the last five to seven years. Consolidation is taking place across many parts of the world, uh, very much uh, heavy in the North American business certainly making its way into the European business. Um, so what happens in these mature markets is consolidation is inevitable. It has to happen. It's going to constrict. And that's what's going on. And I think that's where we're going to find some opportunity. I really do believe there's opportunity in the value chain. Because when you think about the entire value chain of our business from the collision centers, well, the, the, end, the customer, the driver, the collision center, the insurer, the claims management person, the OEM, um, the fleet leasing company. There's a lot of people involved in that and including us and other suppliers. I think the most important thing is trying to find out how to work and understand that value chain and find the opportunities in there to build a model that gets the service to the collision center and to that end driver that we want that the OEMs want, that the fleet leasing companies want, that the claims management companies want, that the insurance companies want. We've got to look at the value chain, not just the collision space. There's a lot of room there. There's a lot of room for efficiency gains. There's a lot of opportunity for, you know, maybe slightly different strategies. Uh, so I, I, that, that's where I'm really bullish. Although the, 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 the collisions may decline, I think there's opportunity in the value chain of our business where a new model could help, could help everybody. 
fascinating, Jim. I, I think uh, you know we're all interested to see how how that will play out. But I think you make some very valid points there. So, like, Jim, I'm gonna we're gonna sort of come bring the uh, bring this uh, discussion to a, a conclusion now. One final one final point for me. Look, we Axalta has been a huge supporter of Ibis uh, over over the past few years, and I think you know we've we've really helped bring you know new concepts, new ideas. We've put the you know, leadership people together. Uh, we've created a buzz around the industry. So, my final question for you: How, how important is is, is Ibis to, to you as Axalta, uh, and why is it important to invest in these wider industry initiatives going forward? Uh, uh, that's a great one to end on, uh, Jason. So, you know, we've known each other for a number of years. We've been involved in IBIS at different levels for a number of years. I think it was 2019 that you and I signed a multi-year agreement uh, for a global partnership. So it's still very recent in my mind. Uh, and the reason why we made that investment is quite simple. Um, what IBIS brings is, is information. What IBIS brings is the top leaders in our industry together. Now, being a top leader means typically you're very busy. So you now have the top leaders in our industry, busy people in one place. Yeah. And we want to support that because what happens there is information is then given from multiple sources, not just one. You provide multiple sources of information from multiple leaders, multiple parts of our industry that enable all of us to go back and form our own opinions, our own thoughts about what's going to happen. And from those thoughts, build your own individual company strategy. Well, I don't know another place that you can do that, Jason. Busy people, top leaders, lots of sources of information allows you to develop your own opinion and then develop your own business strategy. I think that's what it's about. For me, that's what it's always been about. Brilliant. Thanks, Jim. What a, a fantastic sort of a summary to, to end this discussion on. So, Jim, a huge thanks to you personally and to, to Axalta for supporting IBIS and, and really for being available today to, to go through this Partners in the Spotlight. It's been fantastic to hear um, from you and hear about some of the exciting strategic things that are happening in your view of the future. So thanks so much to that. Um, Everybody, I hope you've enjoyed uh, the session today. Uh, you can go to the IBIS website to, uh, to see this interview, uh, and you can also find more Partners in the Spotlight information at um, ibisworldwide.com. So on that note, uh, we'll say goodbye, and a huge thanks to you, Jim, again. Thank you, Jason.